Welcome to the D-Zone YouTube channel. I'm Adam and today's video is going to be a precursor to an extremely detailed series we're going to be doing on this channel, guiding you exactly through the process of rebuilding a four-stroke dirt bike or ATV engine. So I've been rebuilding a uh, four-stroke dirt bike ATV motorcycle engines for the past five years and I've learned a lot of really valuable information uh, that I really want to share with everybody out there in this series um, just so I can help keep your guys' bikes out of the dealership so you can save money and also just feel accomplished in yourself for going through that entire rebuild on your own. And specifically what we're going to be talking about in today's video is I wanted to go over some of the really common questions that I get. Um, I've rebuilt engines before on my channel and I've had a lot of questions that don't necessarily have to do with the mechanical work of the rebuild uh, but just things you want to know beforehand so like what's the difference between rebuilding a stock versus a race engine um, what tools do I need to have on hand or how do I even know if my engine is ready for a rebuild or if my engine even needs a rebuild so we're definitely going to talk about all that and I do want to mention one more thing before we jump into the rebuild and that is don't get intimidated by it a lot of people see a four-stroke engine and they get intimidated. Um, really, it's not much more complicated than a two-stroke engine. Um, as long as you have, like follow a video series like this and have your service manual on hand, you should definitely be fine and just take your time. I definitely believe that anybody out there can do it. But that's enough of an overview. Let's jump straight into this video series. So here is the engine we're gonna be rebuilding in this series. Uh, this is a mid-2000s Yamaha YZ450F engine. And the reason why I chose this engine is because um, this engine is really going to apply to pretty much all the engines out there. Uh, most of these engines are really similar and the Yamahas have a lot of similarities between the other manufacturers. Um, if you have another manufacturer's engine, I still recommend you watch this series because we're going to go over like all the basic concepts and they're all going to apply from this engine and then I'll address some differences in other engines as we go through this series. So for example, Suzuki has a little bit different of a shifting mechanism and we'll kind of talk about that when we get to that part on this engine. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about with this engine is basically how do you know if your engine needs to be rebuilt? Obviously, you don't want to take it out of the frame of the bike or the ATV or whatever you're working on if you don't know if the engine needs to be rebuilt. Um, well, a lot of times it's going to be pretty obvious, so we're not really going to talk about the obvious signs. This engine is seized, so I definitely know it needs to be rebuilt. Um, sometimes a valve will hit the piston or the engine, you'll hear the engine blow up or all of a sudden the engine seized and you just can't get it to start. Um, those are pretty obvious signs that you need to rebuild it. Um, but in a lot of cases, um, you're not going to know or the engine's just pretty tired. It's been really hard to start for a while. Um, that case, we have a test that we can do to kind of check. Um, do we do just need to do the top end? Do we need to do any part of the engine or do we need to do both the top end and the bottom end? Um, this test that we're going to do is going to tell you that. So I'm going to head over to a fully assembled bike here and I'll show you guys how to perform the test on that just so you know how to do it um, as opposed to just doing it on an engine that's already removed. Okay, so here's the bike we're going to be performing the test on. The test we'll be performing is a leak down test and the reason why I told you I was just going to do this bike just because I want to show you how to actually perform a leak down test on a bike that is fully assembled. Uh, but I'm going to assume a leak down test is not the first thing I would do in this scenario if a bike is hard to start or not starting. You know, I would check things like the carburetor, uh, make sure your carburetor is sealing up correctly, and check your valve clearances, change your fuel out. There's a whole bunch of things I would do before actually performing a leak down test, and I'll probably make a video on that at some point. So definitely subscribe to the channel um, if you want to learn about how to uh, diagnose a hard to start bike. Uh, but assuming you've checked all of those things, um, you're going to want to do a leak down test. So the reason why we would do a leak down test as opposed to a compression test, a compression test doesn't test modern four stroke engines correctly because they have a decompression pin. Uh, when you kick the bike over at lower RPMs, um, the engine is going to release some compression. You're not going to get an accurate reading. So we have to do what's called a leak down test. And basically what a leak down test does is you will put um, compressed air where the spark plug goes into the engine and they'll get the engine to top dead center where the valves and the piston should be fully sealed because um, that's when you're going to be making your compression and then your explosion strokes. You want everything um, to be sealed at that point. Obviously, you're going to have a little bit of leakage, uh, but what you're testing for with a leak down test is where is that leakage coming from in the engine and how much are you actually leaking out? So how much potential air are you losing? 
So now that you're all caught up on why we're actually doing a leak down test on this bike, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and remove this shroud here, probably the gas tank and the seat, just to get a better angle to get over the cylinder head to attach the leak down tester. So we'll start off here by removing the two front radiator shrouds. It's just one bolt that attaches them to the radiator and then we'll move back to the seat. It'll be two 12 millimeter bolts on most Japanese motorcycle that holds the seat on in the back. And we can take the seat off now and get the last two bolts that are holding on the gas tank. Before we can actually remove the gas tank, we have to unhook the fuel line from the carburetor and turn off our petcock so we don't have fuel pouring all over the floor. Now finally we can take the fuel tank and the shrouds off the bike and we'll go ahead, next step is to remove the coil uh, on the top of the spark plug and then we can go ahead and unscrew the spark plug. On um, this bike is a little bit difficult to get to so it helps to have a magnet on hand to uh, extract the spark plug after uh, you get it loosened in there. Alright, so now that the spark plug is removed, we can go ahead and install our leak down tester hose. This is what allows us to install the compressed air into the cylinder. And finally, we can remove our caps here. This will allow us to get the engine to top dead center. Alright, so we got the engine here in the perfect position that we need to do the leak down test. Um, we have our alignment set up. You can see we have these two alignment uh, spacers here lined up with the dot on the flywheel. So that's exactly where we need to be to do the test. Um, I did go just past the dot and then come back. That'll allow the rings to seat and it will allow um, this flywheel nut to not try and work itself off when we add the compressed air to the engine. So the next step is to attach a breaker bar to keep the engine in place while you're using the leak down tester. There will be a good amount of force on this breaker bar. So I'm gonna use some zip ties and then have a friend hold it. Um, if you don't have a friend handy, it's going to be a little bit more difficult, so you'll probably want to vice grip it in place uh, just to make sure that it doesn't come loose. And now that we got our breaker bar all secured, I'll go ahead and zip tie the throttle to wide open. Uh, this will allow me to hear if there's any leaking through the intake valves. And finally, I'll go ahead and remove the coolant reservoir cap, and this will just allow me to see if there's a head gasket failure resulting in bubbling coming out from the coolant reservoir. So now I'm just going to calibrate my Motion Pro leak down tester. This gauge is nice because it goes straight to the percentages and reads. Uh, you don't have to worry about calculating. Most gauges will have two um, sensors on them. So this one's nice because it just has the one. And uh, it comes with a complete kit and everything. So I'm pretty happy with it. I'll have it linked down below in the description. But now I am ready to hook up my air supply, which is 100 PSI, to my leak down tester and see what I get. So as you can see here, um, it's kind of hard to see, but we're getting about 5% leakage, which is actually really good. Uh, so I'm not going to actually check where the leakage is coming from because there's really hardly any, and I can't really hear any air coming out. Um, but I will go around here and show you real quick uh, where you can check if you are getting somewhere in the range of 20 to 30% leakage uh, to see what you might want to check on your engine. Okay, so now that we checked our leak down, we did our leak down test, uh, we realized that this bike is actually in a really good range of about 5%, so we're happy with that. Uh, but unfortunately, I didn't get to show you where the leakage would actually come out of if you were having the higher leakage in the 20 to 30% range. Um, you'd probably want to do a rebuild on whatever issue was going on. Definitely 30 and above is probably the engine's broken and needs a rebuild. It probably wouldn't start at that range. But if you were in that 15 to 20% as well, and you wanted to have a race engine, get it back down to that five to 10% range of leakage, um, I'll show you guys what to check as well. So uh, there's four things that it could be. It could be the piston rings, the intake valves, the exhaust valves, and the cylinder head gasket. So if it was a cylinder head gasket failure and you're getting leaked through that, it would come out bubbles through the coolant. That's why we took the cap off uh, so you could see if there's any bubbles coming out of here. Um, if it was an intake valve leak, um, it would come through the carburetor, that's why we have the throttle locked open, and it would come through there and then out through your air boot, and you'd be able to feel that with your hand. Sometimes, you can definitely hear it, but sometimes if it's faint, uh, you might need to remove the air filter to actually feel that. Um, if you have an exhaust valve leak, that would be just come through your exhaust system out back to the muffler, and you could actually put your hand on that and likely feel it. Um, if you had the piston ring leak, this one's just a little bit harder to track, but what would happen here is basically the air is going down past the ring. So usually it'll come out kind of at the bottom of the crankcase here and it'll pressurize it and you'll feel the air coming out. 
Um, and sometimes, you know, they'll have a breather hose in the cylinder head that you actually have to track and then feel if there's air coming out of that too. All right, so now that we went over leak down testing and kind of talked about how that can help you decide whether or not your engine needs a rebuild or what exactly you need to rebuild on your bike, um, we can move on to the next really common question that I get, which is uh, what tools do you have to have on hand for your rebuild and which ones are kind of somewhat necessary or will help save you time. So let's jump right into what tools you need to have on hand. Okay, so the first tool we'll talk about here is your crankshaft pulling and installing tool. Uh, this tool is super handy to have. I definitely recommend it, but it is not 100% needed. If you are replacing your crankshaft, you technically don't need it because you could hammer out your crankshaft and then sweat it back in both bearings. But if you're a first time engine builder, um, I would definitely recommend this tool. Or even if you rebuild a lot of engines, it's just going to save you time and money in the long run. So that's it for that one. Let's move on to this next one here. So this tool here is what's called a crankcase splitter and basically this will split your cases to allow you to access your crankshaft and main bearings and your transmission. Um, so the reason I definitely recommend this one is because to split it without you risk damaging your engine cases which are extremely expensive. So I'm going to say this tool is absolutely necessary. This next tool here are snap ring pliers and these pliers allow you to remove clips that hold on gear. Um, clips that hold on your gears and your transmission just holds your transmission together. I definitely recommend these pliers. Um, I don't think you absolutely need them. If you have another way to remove clips, um, that's fine. Uh, but if you don't, I think these tools are definitely helpful and will definitely save you time in the long run. The next tool here, I've been using this since I started building engines. It's a clutch holding tool. Um, definitely recommend it. It can also hold your flywheel in place on some types of engines, not all types of engines. Uh, but I definitely recommend this tool. I think if you were to hold the clutch without it, I've seen people do it with towels or something like that. Um, it can be done, but this will save you time and also be a lot more effective and you won't risk damaging your engine near as much. So this tool here is what's called a gear jammer. And when I get into the actual rebuild, you'll see exactly how this is used um, and why it's handy. You can use something like a copper washer or something like a soft metal to hold the gears in place. Uh, but this has a magnet on it and it usually gets right into the teeth and you don't really risk damage them since this is a really soft aluminum. So for whatever it is, I think it's around $10. I think it's a really good uh, tool to have on hand. Loctite, something you're definitely going to come across, either blue or red Loctite. It'll say in your manufacturer specifications, uh, but definitely something you want to have on hand for the rebuild. And this waterproof grease here. Um, this is not abs usually not absolutely necessary. Sometimes the manufacturer will call for it um, and sometimes not, but it's definitely helpful for holding down gaskets and keeping them in place um, while you're attaching the cases together. And then assembly lube, you could technically use engine oil instead, but this is what the manufacturer recommends to lube everything up when you're reassembling the engine. So I do recommend uh, that you have this on hand. Um, definitely helps protect your engine on the initial startup. This tool here is a piston pin puller by Motion Pro, and this tool has come in clutch for me a few times. Definitely helped me to remove some piston pins that just were kind of stuck in there and stubborn, but not one you need to have unless uh, you come across the issue. I wouldn't necessarily order this unless you're doing a ton of engines or you come across the issue. And now we'll move on to this uh, threaded engine lockup tool. So basically this threads into your spark plug hole and can hold the engine in place if you were to torque down your flywheel nut or something like that. Uh, definitely, I don't think this is a necessary tool, but it's super helpful in case you forget to torque down a couple things before you button the engine up all the way. This tool here is what's called a flywheel puller. And on a lot of engines, this is essential to get your flywheel off. Um, there's a couple alternative ways to do it without a flywheel puller, but none of them are really that safe and definitely just recommend you get the proper tool. These things are pretty cheap. You can either get a whole kit of them, which will cover pretty much all engines, or you can just get whichever one for the particular engine you're working on. And the final of the smaller hand tools here is a seal puller. Um, so these are really good for pulling seals out. Definitely not necessary. You could probably use a screwdriver, but this will help you from damaging your engine and it just helps you get a good angle to pull those stubborn seals out. So definitely recommend that one. So this tool here is a blind bearing puller and definitely recommend it if you're tearing into the bottom end of your engine. I'll show you how it's used when we actually start working on the engine here. But 
Uh, for now, this tool, I'd say this is probably a must have if you're doing a bottom end. This here is a valve spring compressor and it's super handy if you're working on a four stroke cylinder head to be able to remove the valves. You're definitely going to need it in that scenario. If you're working on a two stroke or you're just, you're not touching the valves on your engine, um, I guess then you wouldn't need it at that point. But if you're doing anything to the cylinder head, um, you'll definitely want to have a valve spring compressor. So the final thing we'll talk about here is an engine stand. This is not 100% necessary. I've done a lot of engines without them, but it does make your life a lot easier. Um, you can actually, what's nice about them is you can rotate um, your engine to whatever position you want it to be in. Um, so if I wanted to move it forward, I could move it like this. Um, and just allows you to get into different spots of the engine. You also have a pan here to catch any oil that drips out and there's always oil dripping out when you work on an engine um, and it just holds the engine secure in place for you to torque down your bolts. So I recommend it if you're probably doing two or three engines or you think you'll do a couple at some point but if you're just doing one you could probably get away without it. Alright so that's going to be it for the tool section here. I think we went over pretty much all the tools you're going to need but I'm sure I forgot a couple so if you guys have any tools that we forgot here, go ahead, go down to the comment section and let us know. Um, but the next thing we're going to move on to is some more questions, just some smaller questions that I'm going to jump into real quick that I think will be really helpful. Uh, but before we do that, I do want to mention that all these tools will be down in the description with links and then you can also check out our website here. I'll put it up on the screen. This video is getting a little bit long, so I'm just going to go through like three questions real quick and then we can end it for today. If you're still sticking around, I hope you've learned a lot in this video so far. I really appreciate you watching towards the end of this video. But the last thing we'll talk about here is, you know, I get the question of what parts should I order, what parts should I replace? Um, that's something we'll definitely go into once we start tearing the engine apart and inspecting stuff and giving it a look. Um, it's kind of hard to talk about that without actually having the engine open. And then one more thing I'll address here is, you know, your work surface. You definitely want a clean work surface with good lighting. It will definitely help you uh, succeed when you're doing your rebuild. If you have a steel table, maybe just throw a sheet of plywood on it. Uh, I recommend working on wood just because a lot of the parts on these engines are, you know, softer aluminum and stuff like that. So you definitely want to, uh, you know, make sure that aluminum is safe from getting damaged from a metal table. Um, also, I have, you know, good lighting, good LEDs in here that will really help to... Uh, you know, help when you're looking at parts and helping you analyze them because if you have bad lighting you might miss a lot of things on the parts. And the last thing I'll say is just to, you know, make sure you're organized. Uh, have a good set of bags from the grocery store and get those labeled before you do your rebuild. Uh, that'll definitely help you as well. So yeah, I appreciate you watching the video. I'm really excited to get into the work on the engine and actually show you guys how the process is done. So thanks for watching.